Oh, good. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Wild Watershed Rattlesnakes, a Zoom presentation with Dr. Emily Taylor. If you are just joining us, we always love to know where you're tuning in from today. Feel free to drop your name and where you live in the chat. We will get started here in just a minute. We'll wait for some folks to join us in the meantime. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. If you're just joining us, feel free to say hello in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from today. You can hover your cursor over your Zoom screen and select chat. And then if you want everyone to see your chat, you click the little drop down and select everyone. Welcome. Welcome everybody. Lots of folks, Santa Rosa, Sebastopol, San Luis Obispo, welcome. We are glad to have you here with us this evening. I will go ahead and get started with my introduction so that we have as much time as possible to learn about rattlesnakes this evening. So hello everyone again, thank you for joining us. If you haven't already, feel free to say hello in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from today. Welcome to our first webinar in the Our Wild Watershed themed programs that we are launching this fall. These community programs will bring in experts to focus on a specific animal or plant found within the Laguna watershed. We are kicking it off this evening with learning all about rattlesnakes, one of the most misunderstood creatures in the Laguna and fascinating and beautiful. And I bet many of you are here because you are curious about them or because you have stories about rattlesnakes. And feel free to drop your anecdotes in the chat box about rattlesnakes to get us started. And as we go, we would love to get your questions in the chat as well. So feel free to ask questions as we go. We will have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, there might be a lot of questions, in which case I'll try and just take the questions that apply to the most folks in the audience, some of that good general information that we don't cover in the presentation. So again, my name is Allison Titus. I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. I'd like to begin this presentation with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional land stewards. And it also recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and the land. The Laguna watershed sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. To raise awareness for ancestral and current indigenous people's presence in the Laguna watershed, we pay our respect to the past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their Wapo neighbors. And this always feels really important to share before talking about our work here in the Laguna. And if you would like to know more about the land that you live on, uh, you can visit this link here. I will drop it in the chat to search where about where you live. Alrighty, there we go. So a little bit more about the Laguna Foundation. Some of you have probably heard this spiel many times, but for those of you who are new tuning in this evening, the Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. The Laguna is a wetland like this, and a 22 mile long waterway looks more like this here, as well as an entire watershed that encompasses Santa Rosa, Cotati, Roner Park, and parts of Sebastopol and Windsor. The Laguna wetlands have been heavily impacted by development in the Santa Rosa Plain, and they now face important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. However, that's not the whole story. Despite those challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity hotspot, home to endangered plants and animals, 
and has the very special designation of being a wetland of international importance, one of only 34 sites in the US with this honor. So we at the Laguna Foundation restore these special wetlands by completing conservation science projects, planting native trees, shrubs, and forbs, and managing invasive species. We also increase public knowledge and appreciation of the Laguna through our Learning Laguna Elementary School programs, our Camp Thule Summer Camp, and community programs like this webinar today. Thank you to those of you that included a donation with your registration for this program. Our organization relies on donations from individuals like you to continue our critical restoration, conservation, and education work. Uh, if you didn't donate but you would like to, I will include a link where you can donate securely on our website in the follow-up email that will be coming to you on Friday after this event. And if you enjoy this program today, we have many more coming up this fall, including more Our Wild Watershed themed programs. So you can check out our community education page on our website for more information about those upcoming events. This presentation will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel by Friday. And as I mentioned, as we go along, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box. Without further ado, it is my pleasure this evening to, in to introduce our speaker, Dr. Emily Taylor. She is a professor of biological sciences at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. She fell in love with snakes as an undergrad at UC Berkeley, where she conducted research on the Baja California rattlesnake and then wrote a senior thesis for her English major on the representation of the serpent in the Bible. She got her PhD in biological sciences um, at Arizona State University studying rattlesnakes. And currently she keeps busy teaching classes ranging from herpetology to medical endocrinology, conducting research on lizards and snakes. And most recently, starting a rattlesnake consulting business called Central Coast Snake Services, where she helps people coexist with rattlesnakes. You can follow her work on social media. She has a great Twitter. I already learned a lot just from looking at Twitter today, um, all about her work. And she is also on Instagram. And we will include all of this information for you in the follow-up email as well. Thank you so much for being with us, Emily. I am so excited to learn from you this evening. Awesome, thank you for having me. Let's get my screen shared here. Hang on just a second. Okay. All right, that should be all set, yes? Okay, great. Well, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Allison, for inviting me and thank you to those of you who've tuned in. Um, that was a fun bio. Hopefully you all heard that I was somewhat of a local girl to you all because I went to UC Berkeley. But what I didn't tell Allison was that I also went to Novato High School. So um, my dad was in the Navy and I moved around every two or three years, but I did live in Marin County for my freshman and sophomore year of high school. And then all the while that I was back in um, college, I would go home because my parents also lived in Novato th then. So I'm very familiar with um, the sort of Northern Bay area and where you, many of you based on the chat live. So looking forward to talking with you about your local rattlesnakes. As, uh, as well as California rattlesnakes in general today. All right, so my goal in this presentation and in general with what I do with my company, Central Coast Snake Services, is to promote the safety of people and their pets in areas where there's rattlesnakes. And my secondary goal is also to reduce the unnecessary killing of rattlesnakes via education, because my hope is that by the end of today's talk, where you're gonna learn all of these really fascinating things about rattlesnakes, is that you will see, if you didn't already know, if you're not already a fan of rattlesnakes, that you will see what actually gentle and incredible animals they truly are. And you will learn that in fact, a lot of what we are fed by TV shows and the media is really just not true at all. I actually have this hypothesis that dangerous animals are even more unfairly portrayed than other animals. The more, the more potentially dangerous the animal could be, 
the worst they seem on TV in terms of being portrayed on like Animal Planet and so on as being these horrible beasts who want to bite you. But rattlesnakes really couldn't be anything further from the truth. So I'm going to do that today by myth busting with you. And I've structured this talk so that as I myth bust some of the things you've heard about rattlesnakes, I will be teaching you all about their actual natural history and the actual things that they do in the wild. So the structure allows me to go through one by one and talk about how they reproduce, which is one of the most fascinating things that I learned in college and why I decided to move from being an English major to going and getting my PhD in biology and studying them for now 25 years, as well as um, having a business on the side that helps people in rattlesnakes coexist to their size, how big are rattlesnakes really? And then their behavior, some of the most fascinating things that we're learning right now are how complex the social behavior of rattlesnakes are, as well as what they eat, what eats them. So lots of good natural history. I will, of course, talk about snake bite as well, snake bite to people, which is actually a very, very dangerous and serious medical condition. The risk of it, though, tends to be overblown in terms of people's fears of snake bite. Also, there's a lot of false information about what you're supposed to do if you are snake bitten. And so I'm here to set the record straight and give you the true facts. And then at the later in the talk, I'm going to talk about what good are rattlesnakes anyway? Why are they actually really important to have in our environment? And why is the world better off with them as opposed to just killing rattlesnakes left and right? And then at the end, I have tailored this section to you folks in the Santa Rosa area and surrounding areas about what if there's a rattlesnake in your yard? And what if you don't feel equipped to deal with it yourself? And I have some resources for you on some local people who will come and help you, some experts who will come and help you out. And my hope is that I finish early enough to where I can do lots of Q&A, because usually I find that people who are listening to these talks have experiences with rattlesnakes in the past. They may have questions, or you may have some interesting insights that you can share with me to help me continue to learn about rattlesnakes as well. So let's go ahead and get right into it. All right. The number of myths about rattlesnakes is staggering. So I couldn't possibly cover them all in a single small, talk, uh, small um, short talk. In fact, there's so many different myths that I've chosen some of the ones that I think are the biggest ones. And I've also chosen them as a way to guide you through um, learning about some of the most interesting things about rattlesnakes. So the first one that some people may have heard is that rattlesnakes lay eggs. Now that's a myth, it's not true. Rattlesnakes do not lay eggs. In fact, they have live babies, just like mammals do. And their babies have little umbilical cords and placentas. And the mothers actually take really good care of the babies after they're born for about two weeks before they all go their separate ways. So let me show you how this works. This is really interesting how it works. Um, but just in case, again, a lot of people are shocked to hear that not all uh, snakes don't lay eggs, um, especially if you've ever seen one of these little gag gifts where there's a little pouch of rattlesnake eggs and it says, keep in a cool place to prevent hatching. You open it and there's a little um, rubber band trap inside that was gonna be released and make a rattling noise. So it's to scare you that you're opening up a little packet of hatched rattlesnakes. Well, never fear, there's no such thing as rattlesnake eggs in fact. Okay, so I will talk to you now about the annual cycle of the behavior and the reproduction of the Northern Pacific rattlesnake which is the rattlesnake that we have in Northern California. Basically anywhere uh, from the Sierra, top of the Sierra Nevada out to the West coast of California, you have Northern Pacific rattlesnakes. Now, actually scientists argue about the true name of the snake and whether it's a Southern or Northern Pacific rattlesnake and where that cutoff actually occurs. But for all intents and purposes, the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, which is the only kind of rattlesnake that's gonna be in coastal areas of Northern California, um, it's going to range from about southern British Columbia, that's as far north as it goes, on down through Washington and Oregon, northern California, and then somewhere in central California, maybe as far north as the Bay Area, maybe as far south as the central coast where I am, it gives rise to the southern Pacific rattlesnake, which goes all the way down to Baja, California. If we were to then move eastern into the states, in the Eastern California, down in the Southern part, there's a lot more species in the desert there. And then in Northern California, out where you are, if any of you are venturing over into the East side of the Sierra Nevada, then you're gonna get great basin rattlesnakes. But bottom line, one species of rattlesnake. They vary a lot in coloration. There's green ones, brown ones, black ones, light colored ones, so many different colors, but they're all the same species. So let's go ahead and look at a year in the life of the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, specifically how it relates to their reproduction. Okay. 
So we're in summer right now. So I would like to start in the summertime um, over here where we can see that the rattlesnakes are in many cases gathered together to give birth. I'm gonna be returning to this later in the talk because it's a pretty interesting phenomenon about rattlesnakes that we're currently studying, which is why it is that females may get together in these rookeries, which are communal birthing sites to help each other give birth and help care for each other's babies. And uh, meanwhile, a lot of the other animals, um, a lot of the other rattlesnakes, maybe the ones that are not pregnant that year or the adult males are gonna be doing things like eating these prey items like ground squirrels and so on. Okay, so let's zoom in on summer and look at what's happening with these rattlesnakes during pregnancy. This is an ultrasound of a Northern Pacific rattlesnake or a Southern Pacific rattlesnake, take your pick on what you wanna call it. And what we are looking at are these internal eggs that they hold inside their bodies. This is all this white stuff up here is yolk. And down at the bottom, we can see the spine of the developing fetus. That developing fetus will pull the yolk into its body by its umbilical cord over time. Look closely and we can see the beating heart of that developing fetus in an ultrasound right there. So I can tell by looking at this ultrasound that this rattlesnake is only about a third of the way through gestation. So I would guess that this was taken perhaps sometime in June. So the way it works is that female rattlesnakes can mate with a male. They can actually store sperm for many, many, many months, even years they can store sperm and use them again, whenever they want to. They will ovulate and fertilization occurs usually in May of any given year. And that's when we now start to develop the fetus, okay? So it's almost like they have eggs, but they're keeping the eggs inside their body. So they still nourish the eggs with this yolk. And then they're going to grow and grow and grow. And later on in pregnancy, there's going to be very little yolk left. This whole thing will be a fetus. And then they're going to be born. And we now have baby rattlesnakes, which in fact are called pups. That's the official name for a baby rattlesnake. This is not a Northern Pacific rattlesnake, but this is a different species in the process of giving birth. I want to sh show you this because a lot of people just who did know that rattlesnakes are viviparous or life bearing, just picture the babies crawling on out of the mother's cloaca. But in fact, that's not the case. They're gonna be curled up inside that sac. It's the amniotic sac, just like we have um, for human babies. And when they're born, they're still inside this amniotic sac with all of the amniotic fluid. I don't know if you all noticed that, but this mother was very carefully looking and seeing if this baby that she just gave birth to was okay before she came over to check out this one. And now the baby is still in its amniotic sac, the little pup. And the first thing it's gonna do is move around and poke its snout through the amniotic sac and have its first breath, which I think is one of the cutest things I've ever seen animals do. These little baby rattlesnakes with their big eyes. Ah, oh, there's baby's first breath, right? Okay. And like I mentioned before, these rattlesnakes are very good mothers. So not only do they put a bunch of energy into reproduction and put all that yolk that they're, you know, had to take a lot of time and effort to eat the ground squirrels that would fuel that reproduction in which the female rattlesnakes may lose as much as half of their body weight. So it would be like me having a 75 pounds worth of babies and then only weighing 75 pounds afterwards being that skinny. Very, very, very good mothers, but they also stick around and take care of those, ba of those babies, even if the mother rattlesnake hasn't even eaten for months and months and months. Here is a Western diamondback rattlesnake who's recently given birth. You can see that some of those babies are actually still inside their amniotic sacs. And that mother is looking very suspiciously at the cameraman saying, don't you come near my babies. And in fact, they will guard them. They will um, do a lot of things. We're not sure what they're doing. They're paying attention to them, making sure that they're okay until the baby's first shed about 10 days later to maybe two weeks later and off they all go. What we don't know is anything about how these animals then potentially stay in touch later in life. We know that we see baby rattlesnakes coming back to the dens where the parents are. We know that we have these communal nests where I told you about like rookeries where multiple females are giving birth together. Are those sisters? Are they cousins? Rattlesnakes appear to have really strong and important social structures that we're just starting to learn about. I'll come back to that later on. But first I would like to move now into the next myth, which is where I'm gonna really start busting some serious myths, all right? So most of you have probably had someone tell you something along the lines of this. I was chased by a 10 foot rattlesnake. So I actually um, was sneaky here and I put two myths together in one. The first myth that rattlesnakes chase people. The second one is that rattlesnakes get 10 feet. Neither of those two things are true. So the term aggression, aggressive is used a lot to characterize rattlesnakes. And that is an improper word to use to characterize rattlesnakes unless you're a mouse or a squirrel that's trying to be eaten by that 
uh, that's that's going to be eaten by that rattlesnake. And that's because rattlesnakes are defensive. They, if they bite a person, if they get into a defensive posture, they're doing that because they feel threatened by that person. Snake bites are 100% caused by either a person messing with a snake or a person having an accident where they step on the snake or they don't see the snake there when they put their hands there. Rattlesnakes do not want to bite people and they will never chase people either. If there's an illusion of chasing, it's oftentimes because the rattlesnake really wants to get to a certain spot and you happen to be standing in its way and it might be moving into that spot. And then furthermore, rattlesnakes don't get very big. People really like to overestimate rattlesnakes. Again, this goes back to, I think that dangerous animals like um, snakes and sharks and those types of organisms, uh, they're subject to a lot of um, legends here. And this is what we see when we go online and we look at big rattlesnake in Google. We see all of these people um, holding up these big rattlesnakes and trying to say, look at this giant animal. Well, I want to point out something that these are all pretty normal sized rattlesnakes. They're all maybe about three feet long. And whenever you see a picture of a rattlesnake and it looks really big, ask yourself, what is the perspective here? Because most people are trying to get you to think it's bigger because supposedly bigger snakes are better, I guess. And they are going to be holding it in front of them towards the camera. And it's a trick called forced perspective. So here's a, a, a nice human being showing us with a toy rattlesnake how that toy rattlesnake, which is maybe three or four feet long, can appear much, much longer when you hold it out in front of you in the camera. So indeed, Northern Pacific rattlesnakes don't come anywhere close to 10 feet. A big male Northern Pacific rattlesnake is going to top out at around four feet. Um, some of you may have seen them a little tiny bit bigger than that. They do occasionally get bigger than that, but it's very rare for them to get much bigger. The average size of an adult male rattlesnake is going to be about three feet long. Females are a little bit smaller. Uh, big females can get as big as a male, but it's, it's not as common. So usually we're going to see rattlesnakes ranging in the two to three foot range. They're born about 12 inches or so. They're about the size of a pencil, both in width and length. And then they will grow and become reproductively mature at perhaps age five or six. It really depends on how much food they get. And rattlesnakes can live over 60 years. And typically in the wild, they don't live quite that long. They may get eaten by a predator before then. But the big four foot male rattlesnakes that you're seeing are usually at least 10 years old, oftentimes 20 years old. So like I mentioned before, it is definitely a myth that rattlesnakes are laying in wait in nature to bite people. Rattlesnakes truly want to have nothing to do with us, which is part of the reason for my giving this talk today is to try to convince you that rattlesnakes want to be left alone and that they're really important uh, members of our ecosystem. But also a negative encounter with a rattlesnake can be very serious. So I want to prepare you to avoid those. Well, why do we have this myth here that rattlesnakes are weighing, laying in wait in uh, nature to bite people? The truth is that rattlesnakes are curled up waiting to try to bite a squirrel or a rodent. And if TV shows showed that, it'd be pretty darn boring because they just sit there. Instead, we see things like this, ranging from the silly, like these boa versus python movies, and of course, things like the movie Anaconda and Snakes on a Plane, but even supposedly educational te television, um, like on Animal Planet or Discover Channel, and then especially nowadays, YouTubers are really out there to grab your attention and to try to grab your money. And none of it is true. So the most successful YouTubers now who are going out and harassing wildlife are getting a lot of attention for it. And it's too bad because it really is not the way that rattlesnakes are at all. In fact, this is what rattlesnakes do 90% of the time. They curl up and they sit there. They're highly camouflaged. They're hoping beyond hope that you don't see them. They can see you, they know that you're there and they're relying on their camouflage to hope that you'll go on by because they think of you as a predator. The other reason that they're sitting there highly camouflaged is because they want to sneak up on their prey. They wanna ambush prey. They're hoping that something will run by and that they can grab it. And this is where I get to tell you about all the things that rattlesnakes eat and all the things that eat rattlesnakes to show you what an important component of our ecosystem they are. They're a central component of our food web. Baby rattlesnakes like to eat lizards a lot of lizards. So those blue belly lizards that are called Western fence lizards that many of you have running around your yard, those are the favorite food of baby rattlesnakes. And as baby rattlesnakes start to get a little bit older, they will then transition into other types of food. Specifically, the occasional bird, here's a fun fact about rattlesnakes that eat birds. Mostly when a rattlesnake bites prey, it's going to bite and rapidly inject the prey and let go. And then the prey will run away and die and the rattlesnake will follow the scent trail of its envenomated prey to find it. 
Well, that wouldn't work for a bird because the bird would fly away and there would be no scent trail for it to follow. So rattlesnakes are adapted to know this. And when they uh, ambush hunt a bird, they bite and they hold on. Very, very cool. But by far the biggest prey item for Northern Pacific rattlesnakes is rodents, including the California ground squirrel, which is one of the, the biggest pest species in California. So California ground squirrels also have their positive aspects, just like rattlesnakes do, of course. But in terms of the amount of damage that they do to infrastructure, it dramatically outweighs anything that a rattlesnake would do. California ground squirrels are major agricultural pests. Here on Cal Poly campus, population of ground squirrels completely emptied out one of the um, storage bins of animal feed. It had two tons of feed and it was emptied out in a week by these ground squirrels. So they cause um, hundreds of millions of dollars in losses in ag feed in in crops. And also they are undermining dams. They're literally burrowing into dams and other structures. So a big pest species, yet one, one of many reasons why we should love rattlesnakes for helping to control their numbers. But rattlesnakes, of course, they're not actually top predators. They get eaten by a lot of things too. So rattlesnakes get eaten by badgers. Uh, badgers seem to be able to eat anything they want to. <laughs> Uh, we don't know yet whether badgers are resistant to rattlesnake venom. We think they probably are, but to this date, I haven't been able to find anyone who's willing to trap a badger and get blood samples for us because badgers are pretty badass. Um, in addition, this is one of my favorite photos that we took when we were in, in the, doing field work. This pregnant female rattlesnake was acting really weird. She's upside down on her back. And if you take a really close look in the center back here, you might see this little coil of a California king snake. And in fact, it's actually a big California king snake that is constricting this female rattlesnake because king snakes aren't venomous, so they kill by constricting their prey. And yes, we sat and watched this California king snake that probably weighed the same amount as that rattlesnake kill and eat that rattlesnake. So this would be like me eating a 150 pound hamburger all in one bite without using my hands. It's amazing what king snakes can do and also what rattlesnakes can do. Because rattlesnakes can do that with a squirrel too. They can eat these huge squirrels. We do know that California king snakes are resistant to rattlesnake venoms. So king snakes like to eat all kinds of snakes, including rattlesnakes. And for this reason, many people know this. I found California king snakes are highly prized when people find them on their property because they do help to control rattlesnake populations. And then last but not least, let's not forget birds. So birds of prey are a major predator of rattlesnakes. The uh, data are not very strong on whether they're resistant or not, but it appears that they may not be resistant because they know that they should rip the business end of that rattlesnake off. They've cut the head off of the rattlesnake before they carry this, basically this long juicy sausage to their nest to feed the babies. So this forms a, a wonderful food source. All snakes of all kinds do for birds of prey, like owls and hawks. Um, the point I'm trying to tell you here is that rattlesnakes occupy an extremely important part of our food web. Um, things like these herbivores, if these herbivores were to reproduce out of control, not only would the ground squirrels continue to undermine dams and buildings and eat animal feed, but they would strip bare all of our vegetation. So these rodents are kept under control by top predators and also by what we call meso predators. So things like these rattlesnakes, right? Um, rattlesnakes are doubly important because they both provide food to top predators and they are going to eat these um, smaller herbivores. So very, very, very important. Okay, now I'd like to move into snake bite. So it is a myth that rattlesnake bites to people are often deadly, but it's a reason, there's a reason that it's a myth. The reason that the myth, um, that it's a myth that they're often deadly is because rattlesnake bites are very serious. I'm not going to minimize them at all. Um, they can be disfiguring. They're seldom deadly. And the main reason for that is because we have access to good antivenom as medical treatment. So let me explain. I want to talk about some statistics behind snake bite and also prevention of snake bite. There is about 8,000 venomous snake bites per year in the United States. Um, maybe about half of those are by venomous copperhead snakes, which are related to rattlesnakes, but they're not rattlesnakes. Those don't occur here in California. Those are going to be out in the South and in the Midwest. Another 15 or 20% is going to be from cottonmouth or water moccasin snakes, which also are going to be out in the East. And then the remaining 35% or so is from rattlesnakes. And of those three types of snakes, rattlesnake bites tend to be the most severe. Now, 
Nonetheless, from all of these 8,000 bites, we tend to only get about five deaths per year. It varies. Maybe it's three one year, 12 another year, but it's relatively few. And one of the main reasons for that is the treatment with antivenom. Most of the people who do pass away from a snake bite, it turns out that they actually didn't seek medical treatment. So it is true that medical treatment does save lives when it comes to snake bites. About 15% of defensive bites of rattlesnakes and other types of venomous snakes are actually dry bites. And it's really important to know the definition of a dry bite because it's widely used improperly. Some people, including a lot of medical professionals, say a dry bite is one that doesn't have very severe um, symptoms. But it's actually true that a dry bite is that there's no venom injected at all. So there should be no swelling and no symptoms. If someone's lucky enough to get a dry bite, it was basically the idea that the snake was bluffing. However, as you can see, 85% of defensive bites by a rattlesnake, because all bites to humans are defensive, would be considered to be um, envenomations and very serious medical conditions. So the, the good news is that we have anti-venom to treat this. The bad news is that it's incredibly expensive and it can be absolutely financially crippling for the uninsured or for the underinsured. Anti-venom is, is made by treating either um, horses or sheep with a cocktail of venom proteins from different species of rattlesnakes. So a small enough amount of venom to where the animal is not hurt but a large enough amount of venom that the animal's immune system is going to make antibodies against the thousands of different proteins that actually are occurring in these venoms. And then those are purified and those are kept in refrigerated units at hospitals. They have a, um, a short shelf life and there's various other reasons why they cost so much. But I'm here to tell you that your typical snake bite is in excess of 100 or $200,000 in the United States because of the high cost of medical care and pharmaceuticals in the United States. And that's just the average. There's plenty that go way beyond that. So a few years ago in Santa Barbara, near where I live, there's a Boy Scout who stepped on a rattlesnake um, near Lake Kuyama and his snake bite cost over $600,000 total, over 150,000 of which was just only for the anti-venom. So again, those of us who are insured, we can recover from snake bite. Those of us who are uninsured or underinsured, we may never financially recover from something as serious as this. For that reason, it is really, really, really important to prevent snake bite. But I should also mention that even if people would recover, oftentimes there can be very serious tissue damage to the affected limb. So rattlesnake venoms are made not so much for defense, but more to help digest prey. So there's a lot of toxins in the venom that's going to prevent blood clotting. It's gonna help start eating away at the tissues. And so for that reason, it's possible to have something as severe as an amputation or even to have some loss of function of an affected finger or ankle, and all of which can be very severe. So rattlesnake bites are to be avoided at all costs. And the good news is that a little bit of smarts and um, education about how rattlesnakes behave in the wild can help to reduce your risk to practically zero. Prevention of rattlesnakes bites. Okay, when you're out in the wild, Staying on trails is really important and avoiding tall grass, okay? So tall grass is where the rattlesnakes hang out. Um, rattlesnakes also like to sit with their backs. At least I guess they sort of have backs <laughs> um, up against things like logs or trees. And so looking on the other side of a log before you step there, if you're climbing around, always looking to see where you put your hands and feet, right? So always putting your hands and feet where you can see them. Don't never put them where you cannot see them. Really importantly, I used to have my dogs run around off leash, but I no longer do that anymore. Part of it is for, there's many reasons why it's California has lots of things that dogs will get covered with. If they run around off leash, poison oak ticks, those little fox tails go up their nose. And I've had about three different tri trips to the ER with my dogs to get those things out. But rattlesnakes is the most severe of all those. So there's only about 8,000 snake bites to humans in the United States every year. There's about 30,000 snake bites to dogs. And it can be very, very, very serious many, many, many more dogs than humans die from rattlesnake bite. And so keep your dogs on a leash. Um, it, it's a good thing for them. If you do encounter a snake in the wild, stay about 10 feet away and walk around it. A lot of snake bites happen when people are messing with the snake. Now that's all good and fine if you're out walking around on trails, but what about if your home is in snake country? What about if you live in a place um, like, you know, Marin County, various places, Sonoma County, lots of other areas in Northern California, and indeed throughout California, where there may be rattlesnakes moving into your yard. And in fact, research is now showing that climate change is going to lead to 
It's going to be a benefit to rattlesnakes and it's going to lead to a spread of rattlesnakes where they're active throughout more of the year. And then the drought is pushing those rattlesnakes into people's yards. There was a Guardian article that some of, you, some of you may have seen that was actually based near Santa Rosa that showed that the number of rattlesnakes going into people's yards has dramatically increased in recent years. So what do you do in that case? Well, there's things that you can do. And I have an article on my website about how to make your yard less friendly to rattlesnakes. Things like blocking hiding spots. So areas under porches and under decks, crawl spaces into homes, all those things are big no-nos. Managing the rodents in your property properly, removing dense bushes that rattlesnakes like to hide under, um, avoiding having bird feeders because bird feeders can also attract rodents, which attract snakes. And then definitely, especially in this drought, avoiding water sources leaky sprinklers and um, bird baths, pools, sorry, all those things attract rattlesnakes, okay? Now, uh, before I go on, I just wanna remind everybody that, or tell you if you haven't heard this, that for those of you who have really serious rattlesnake problems, some of you may be able to get rattlesnake proof fencing, but that's a really, um, a really um, major commitment to have that installed. And so a, a lot of times a small change to your property can go a long way. All right, so another myth uh, that's related to snake bite is that if you're bitten, you should cut the wound and suck out the venom. You may have heard other myths. I've heard ones about that you're supposed to use a tourniquet. I've heard that you're supposed to put ice and heat on them. I even heard that you're supposed to uh, shock yourself with a car battery. Please don't do any of those things. All of those things will cause a lot more harm than they will good. In fact, even the snake bite kits that you see being sold in stores, not only do they not work, they make the situation worse. And so it's actually quite easy to know what to do and what not to do. So this list was compiled by Dr. Spencer Green, who is the head of medical toxicology and is a snake bite expert over in Houston. He treats hundreds, maybe even thousands, my gosh, of snake bites per year. He's a wonderful person. And all you have to remember is that you should stay as calm as you possibly can. Take off anything like rings or watches that could be um, constricting the, the limb and get to the emergency room, all right? So you should be elevating the limb too. There's a lot of argument about this out there, but Dr. Green says now that it should be elevated, right? And then just don't do anything else, right? Don't use a tourniquet because using a tourniquet is gonna actually keep that dangerous venom in the affected limb and will not allow it to leave, which may sound like a good thing, except for the fact that now that that venom is in higher concentration, eating away at the tissues of your finger or your toe or whatever, um, no ice, no heat, don't do anything else, okay? They don't work. And then I also get questions um, follow up with this, which is like, okay, fine, but what if I get bit in a really remote area? What if I'm out hiking by myself in the middle of nowhere with no cell signal and I get bit by a rattlesnake? That's a really serious problem because it is true that under those circumstances, depending on the bite, because all bites are very different, um, you may not be able to actually get out on your own power because you may become overcome by the venom. People who do that regularly absolutely should have either a satellite phone or a lower cost version of that, which is a spot satellite messenger. This is one of the other things I learned from this website I'm about to tell you about, which is run by Spencer Green and his colleagues, which is that those people who are going to be out hiking in remote areas alone absolutely need to have the ability to communicate with people in the event of a rattlesnake bite, because I can't tell you what else to do except for try to start walking out, try to stay on the trail. If you have to lay down, lay down in the trail where someone will find you, lay in a recovery position, which is on your side so that if there's vomiting or something, it wouldn't block your airways. This sounds really unpleasant, doesn't it? Get a spot satellite messenger if you're going to be out there alone. And then in the event of a bite, and this is actually going to be an important slide for everyone to screenshot or to write down, or I'm sure Allison will provide this information later on. I'm gonna tell you something that might seem a little weird at first. In the event of a bite of a, you or a family member or a dog or a cat, I want you to post it to a Facebook group. That might sound weird. However, this is an incredible Facebook group. It's called the National Snake Bite Support Network. And they basically, the first thing you should do, they say before you ever, uh, ever uh, go to the Facebook group is get to a hospital or call 911. Make sure that you're on the way to medical care. And then you post your situation to this group. And what they will do is they will pretty much within a few minutes connect you with a medical toxicologist, either a veterinarian for a dog or cat or Dr. Green or one of his colleagues for a snake bite to a person. And they will help you advocate for proper medical care. The reason for this is that it's shocking how few physicians out there actually have training in snake bite treatment. 
a lot of physicians out there actually believe that tourniquets should be used or believe that antivenom should be reserved for only serious snake bites. And all of these things are false. There are published papers about how to treat snake bites, but only a few emergency room physicians actually know how to do that. So it's very important to be an advocate for your own medical care. When I first heard this, I didn't really believe it because I trust doctors, right? However, I've been a member of this group for a long time and I would encourage you to all join this group. What they do is when you join, you have to agree to never comment on anything. So you're just lurking in the background, learning about these bites. You only get to comment if it's an active bite that you're involved in. That's because they don't want to muck up the feed. They want the doctors to be able to talk to the victims and so on. Um, and I've been on there and this time of year, especially there's multiple bites every single day. And I see over and over and over various veterinarians and physicians mistreating snake bites. So here's just one example from a long time ago, a year or so ago, where this young woman was bitten by a timber rattlesnake and she had a serious bite and they told her it was a dry bite instead of, they, well, first of all, they misidentified the snake as a copperhead. That doesn't really matter that much because the treatment would be the same for all of the vipers of North America. Um, they told her it was a dry bite, even though there was tons of swelling, which is absolutely not true. I was mentioning this earlier and the swelling was really, really awful. And then she has permanent damage to her foot now because the physicians refused to use antivenom. So on the national snake bite support network, these physicians will actually provide information and they'll even talk to your doctor on the phone and get them to give proper medical care. I think they've saved thousands and thousands of dogs and cats lives over the recent time since they've been around and they've probably saved people's lives and definitely saved functions of their limbs. So I'm very thankful for these doctors for helping me to learn and I hope they can help you to learn too. Okay, moving on to my very favorite myth of all time, which is probably the most popular one. It's the one most people have heard. And a lot of you are probably saying, oh, shucks, because you thought maybe this was true. It's not true. Baby rattlesnakes are not more dangerous than adults. Again, this comes in different forms. Some people say, oh, I've heard that baby rattlesnakes can't control their venom. That's not true. I've heard that baby rattlesnakes inject more venom. That's not true. The one thing that might be sort of slightly true in some cases is that drop per drop rattlesnake venoms from babies might actually have a higher toxicity than the venoms from adults. That's because the babies are having to eat lizards, which are a little bit harder to kill. That's sometimes true, but none of that really matters when we think about the size of a baby rattlesnake and how much venom it injects. It injects far less venom than an adult rattlesnake. And we see data that show that bites from larger snakes are more severe. So this is the mass of the patient down here on the bottom. And then the snake bite severity score, which includes a number of different symptoms um, that, that combined show how severe the bite is. So bites from the biggest snakes um, right here in blue, okay? The, those are always gonna have for a given patient size, those are always gonna have a higher or more severe snake bite score than ones from smaller snakes. That's because they're injecting more venom. Notice the way that the lines go down here that also shows you that bites to people who weigh more are going to be less severe than bites to people who weigh less. And that's a dilution effect, right? Bites to children are obviously gonna be much more severe because they have a smaller body and um, a smaller amount of, less amount of blood for all that venom to be diluted into, okay? Okay, all right. So I'll look forward to answering any questions you have about snake bites later on. But now I'm moving into this next part of my talk, which is the myth that the world will be better off without rattlesnakes, so we should actually kill them for people's safety. This one is hard for me to comprehend because I am a lover of rattlesnakes. And this is where I always try to step back and put myself in the position of other people, right? And for me, this is not about, um, you know, bad people versus good people. This is about a matter of education, which is why I'm here tonight is to make people understand the reason why killing a rattlesnake is a bad idea. And here's the reasons why. So I'd like to start with a, um, a post here from, that was um, from a little bit south of you all in the South Bay recently, it was uh, earlier this year that took place, um, it was on a next door post. So many of you have probably seen rattlesnake posts on next door. And in this case, there was a rattlesnake in a park and this person posts this to next door and basically tells everyone um, that they killed the snake because they felt it was a threat to the many park goers that take their children and pets to the park. And so they were posting this to basically say, hey, watch out everybody, there's rattlesnakes around, but don't worry, we killed this one. And so, you know, look at the bottom here where we have a number, number of people respond, responding saying, you should have called someone to relocate it. They're absolutely right. And then someone saying indignantly, you did what? And there was actually, this was one of those viral next door posts where there was thousands of responses, uh, most of which in this case were people who were indignant that someone killed wildlife in a park, which is the wildlife's home. It's not our home. And in fact, I'm here to tell you that in my personal opinion, 
it's not a good idea to kill a rattlesnake, even in your own yard. It's never a idea, good idea to kill a rattlesnake. And I'd like to get a little bit philosophical about why that is. I'm going to provide you with some actual information based on my knowledge and also some philosophy. So rattlesnakes are very abundant in all of our wild areas. For every rattlesnake that you see when you go outside, there's probably about 20 more in the general area. They're really good at hiding. And so just because you see one doesn't mean that getting rid of that one makes the area safer. There's almost this implication by the person who posted here that there was this rattlesnake that like ventured from far away into that park. And now that they've killed it, now it's okay. Now the area is safe. That's not true at all. Instead, we need to do things like be wearing footwear and having our children wear proper footwear during the times of year when rattlesnakes are active and to um, teach our children how to not pick up snakes, right? Teach our dogs how to avoid rattlesnakes, which can be done with aversion training. Lots of different ways that we can live peacefully in rattlesnake country. In other words, this kind of thing, thinking is dangerous because it actually makes people feel like a false sense of security if you kill one rattlesnake because it makes people think that there's no other rattlesnakes around. That's not true. The second thing is that killing rattlesnakes, especially in public lands like a park, but really anywhere, does really set a bad example for our children about the value of wildlife. Um, I think that personally, in my philosophical opinion, uh, it's best to teach children that all animals are valuable and all animals have a right to live. And honestly, especially the type of animal that does things like controlling our rodent populations, controlling diseases, like I'll show you momentarily, our good mothers live 60 years, have these complex social systems. What kind of people are we if we're going to be killing those animals? Um, probably the problem here is that other options like relocation of the snake were not considered, but this is probably due to lack of awareness. This person probably didn't understand that rail snakes could be relocated. And I'm going to be returning to this at the end to tell you that there are many people all over California, including in your area, I'll have specific information for the Santa Rosa and surrounding areas that will come sometimes even for free or for a small donation and will actually relocate that rattlesnake for you. I do that here locally on the central coast and um, there's people around to do it for you too. So for that reason, it's never necessary to kill a rattlesnake. And then one of the biggest ones is that killing a rattlesnake is actually really dangerous. So engaging with a rattlesnake is the, really the only way to get bitten by one. It can happen on accident, right? But by going and actually killing a rattlesnake, that's a lot of times when people get bitten. Sometimes the um, rattlesnake climbs up the shovel and kills the person, or not kills the person, bites the person. More often, a person who doesn't understand rattlesnakes, doesn't understand how their body works, might pick up the head to look at it and not realize that the head can, in fact, bite for many minutes, sometimes hours after it's been decapitated from the body. This happens a lot, right? It's not just something I'm selling you. It happens a lot. Okay, so a few years ago, a Texas man decapitated a rattlesnake. It bit him anyway, and he nearly died, his wife says. And I just went ahead and corrected this headline for them. It bit him trying to defend itself, and he almost died. If this person had not engaged with that rattlesnake, both he would be perfectly fine, he probably wouldn't have had those horrible medical bills, and the rattlesnake would be alive as well. So those are all the reasons why killing rattlesnakes are a bad idea. Let's revisit this, right? These animals are very dangerous to us, but only if we engage with them improperly. They are incredibly important parts of our food webs that we have in California. Um, they have incredible efficiency of turning mouse into food for these wildlife that we love so much, like the hawks and mountain lions and bobcats. They're just incredible animals. But there's something else that's hidden in this slide that we can't really see, which is the fact that in addition to keeping these rodent populations under control, they're keeping disease under control. There's a number of diseases that are related, related to rodents in California. So one of them that is present in California, although not nearly as much as the East Coast, is Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is carried by ticks. Ticks is the vector. And ticks actually have a complex life cycle where there's three life stages. There's these two juvenile phase before they're an adult. And it's the adults that bite people and dogs and so on. And so if a juvenile tick is infected with Lyme disease, then that tick can pass it on. Okay, that tick can pass Lyme disease on to that person. Well, those juvenile ticks feed on things like rabbits and squirrels and mice. And just by virtue of eating so many rodents throughout the year, these rattlesnakes may actually reduce the incidence of Lyme disease in the Northeastern United States. And they're probably also doing it in Northern California. Um, not too far from your area is where Lyme disease rates, um, again, not nearly as high as the United States as, uh, as the Eastern United States, 
but there is Lyme disease um, up in like Ukiah and a little bit north of there um, quite a bit. So it's not just that, think about hantavirus carried by deer mice, right? We are helping this spread, keep the spread of hantavirus down. And then my favorite one to think about is those California ground squirrels. Um, if I was giving a, a, a lecture right now where I could talk to you, I'd say, does anybody know what the fleas on the ground squirrels carry? Since I can't ask you that question, I'll just tell you, which is plague. They carry the bacteria that causes plague. And this is endemic to California. It happens every year. So people get infected with plague. They just recently closed down a beach on Lake Tahoe because of an outbreak of plague. And yeah, so this is the bubonic plague, <laughs> the Black Death in the Middle Ages, folks. The reason that we don't have those huge outbreaks now, okay, well, it's not just because of rattlesnakes, but it's also because of antibiotics to help treat that. Point is, rattlesnakes are really important in preventing the spread of these diseases that none of us want to deal with. But of course, rattlesnakes are just also important in their own right for being the amazing animals that they are. Biodiversity is something that is important and should be cherished. And especially when it comes to animals that do interesting things like this one, where this is a very pregnant female rattlesnake. We can see how big her pregnancy hips are, I like to call it. And yet she's curled up with these other baby rattlesnakes. There's one, there's one down there. So those are rattlesnakes that were born to another female from that rookery. Is it her sister's babies? We don't know. Like what's happening with this? We're, we're learning those things right now. Even the babies have these social lives where they all hang out together as they're starting to get ready to shed and to work their way through the world. Um, and again, this complex social behaviors of rattlesnakes are things that we're just starting to learn about now that we have new technology. And I would getting close to the end of my talk. And I would like to tell you about one of the new things that we have that's so fascinating, which is a new community science project, which means that it's a project in which all of you can be scientists to help us. And we need your help because we literally cannot do it on our own. It's called Project Rattlecam. And I would encourage everyone to check it out um, on social media at Rattlecams. And then this also is a link to, our, to, the, um, to the actual Zooniverse site down here that Rattlecams is case sensitive. And Zooniverse is a community science website. If you haven't checked it out, you totally should. There's hundreds, of, well, maybe about a hundred of community science projects where various scientists are asking for your help to help them classify images. And in the case of Project Rattlecam, we put out time-lapse cameras on rattlesnake rookeries out in Colorado all last year, five minutes, every five minutes, all day, every day at three different rookeries. And we were interested in capturing the behavior of the rattlesnakes so that we could study things like how the mothers and the babies interact, how the rattlesnakes are able to get water given that they are so drought stressed and so on. And here's a few of the images that have been classified so far by community scientists for us. So you're looking at a photograph that was taken remotely. So we're not even there all summer and these cameras are just going, snapping away. And then we download them later on of a mother rattlesnake right there. And if you look closely, we can see another one in the background and there's a little baby rattlesnake, okay. And then here's a picture at night where all the snakes came out at night. They're not usually out at night. They came out at night and they're doing something weird here. They're actually drinking off of their coils. This is one of my favorite behaviors of rattlesnakes. As soon as it starts raining, they all rush outside and they flatten their bodies down and coil up and they start drinking off their coils or even off of each other's coils. If you look really carefully, you can see little babies right here drinking off of their mom's coils. Here's a baby drinking off of its own coils. We actually had a little, um, a little, article came out in National Geographic just yesterday or the day before about how rattlesnakes drink off of their skin. Absolutely amazing. And we're starting to be able to learn about this. For example, we just learned a couple months ago from a community scientist, could have been one of you, could have been someone else, that these baby rattlesnakes do this the day they're born. So they're born thirsty. That's something we never knew before because we never had the ability to go up to these remote areas and keep an eye on these snakes all the time. And so um, what I wanted to tell you is that you guys are special tonight because you're the first to hear a announcement that I have, which is really exciting. There's something I've been working towards for a long time, which is, this is great to have these pictures that were taken last year on Zooniverse. They're helping us study them, but wouldn't it be cool if we could watch these animals live? Like sometimes people are watching falcons in the nest on UC Berkeley campus. I get obsessed when they have those every year. What if we had a live cam? I'm here to tell you that we do have a live cam now. So we haven't even made it public yet. Yet You're the first hearing about it. We're waiting, it should go public in the next week or so. We're waiting for a number of little changes to our YouTube site. 
Um, but it's on the Rattlecan YouTube site. It's on there. Uh, here's a clip from just last night. So this is so cool. This is a clip from, this is Central California on the coast near me. And this was just last night as I was getting home from teaching. I want everyone to watch what's happening. Here's a big male rattlesnake coming out of the den. And then if you're watching, if you're really able to see, if you're looking, mm -hmm. there's actually a different snake over here. And again, if I was in person, I would say, does anybody know what snake that is? So you can just yell it out. And I'm hearing some of you. I'm hearing you say, that's a gopher snake. Now watch what happens when the gopher snake sees the rattlesnake. I'm just going to let it go for a minute. Oh boy, never mind. I'm out of here. <laughs> and so we were watching this live and thinking, what the heck? Like, we don't know why the gopher snake would be scared of the rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes don't eat gopher snakes. We don't know what's happening. We're just starting to learn. We've seen now about four females curled up together, getting ready to have their babies. This male came in to check them out. Really, really neat stuff happening. And we're just right in the middle of it. So you can check that out and definitely follow at Rattlecams on Twitter. Instagram or Facebook, and you'll hear more about this coming up. So you're the first to hear it. Okay. So I want to finish my talk by um, acknowledging how important education is in this case. I know that no matter what, no matter how much you knew about rattlesnakes, you've probably learned something new tonight. I look forward to learn learning some new things from you as well tonight. Um, I do outreach events like this on the bottom left. During COVID, we had Girl Scouts coming over to the house and outdoors so they could learn about rattlesnakes. I do this kind of stuff all the time mm -hmm. because with education comes power to be safe around rattlesnakes and therefore the power to learn and to love these rattlesnakes. Okay. So I hope that today has contributed somewhat to your education about rattlesnakes to help you and your pets be safe around rattlesnakes and to help you appreciate them for the beautiful, wondrous, and fascinating creatures that they are. And now my mm -hmm. advice specific to you in Santa Rosa area and surrounding. So this is all going to be the Northern Bay area. What do you do if there's a rattlesnake in your yard? So the first thing you could do is actually admire her, right? If you do see a rattlesnake in your yard and you're not worried about a dog or a child, then you might just leave her alone. She's likely only around temporarily. Um, if you're worried about her, you could spray her with a hose and she'll likely crawl away. Um, but remember that there are professionals who can relocate snakes if necessary. And relocation is actually tricky. You shouldn't hire just anyone. Um, relocators sometimes take snakes miles away and drop them off, which is not good for the snakes. It's not good for the resident snakes who live there. It's not good for the ones who are being relocated. In fact, short distance relocation, usually about a quarter mile away is best for everybody. The snakes seldom come back. Very rarely do they come back and the snakes tend to do pretty well. And so um, animal services in the fire department and police department, sometimes these will perform relocations. So a friend of mine's, her husband is a Novato firefighter, and he does relocate rattlesnakes. But in some other places, they don't do that. They actually are bound and to, to kill the snake. Sometimes they have to kill the snake. So for that reason, calling a professional is a good idea. And I know that there's numerous um, rattlesnake ser removal services in Sonoma and other counties nearby. But I wanted to just particularly recommend two that I have actual experience with that I know do a really great job. So you can write these phone numbers down, take a screenshot if you ever have a rattlesnake in your area. Rattlesnake Relations, um, they charge a fee for rattlesnake removal, but they will never turn anyone away for inability to pay. And so Rattlesnake Relations is a great um, a company to call if you're in Mendocino, Lake, Sonoma, Napa, or Marin counties. I've spoken to the owner. He knows a lot about rattlesnakes. He's a highly trained individual and he's compassionate about snakes. J&W Reptile Rescue is donation-based entirely. And they will go anywhere three hour radius from Vallejo. So depending on how far you are from there, it may take them a while. They also do rattlesnake proof fencing. So you can call them for your fencing needs north of the Bay Area. So again, you may know of other people who can do this. That's great. Here's a couple that are vetted that come um, recommended to me that I want to recommend to you. I'm sure that Allison will be glad to provide those numbers for you. And so I'd like to finish with this conclusion slide here that gives you all of my information for social media. You can follow um, Central Coast Snake Services where I share stories about the snakes that we encounter in the wild and we re relocate from people's yards. Um, if you're curious about my own research in my laboratory, the Physiological Ecology of Reptiles Lab at Cal Poly, you can go to our website, pearl.calpoly.edu. That's where you can also download uh, PDFs of the papers we've written on rattlesnakes, including the recent 
study that showed that climate change will impact rattlesnakes in a positive manner. And then of course, here's the rattle cams, which I hope you will follow on social media or maybe even become a community scientist who helps us study them. Okay, um, on centralcoastsnakeservices.com, which is my website, there's some resources for you. You can take my phone number right there down. You can always text me a photo from anywhere in the world and I will get it identified for you. Just tell me where you are. So if you're up in Northern California, that's really easy. I can find that if you're um, on vacation in China and you see a snake and you wanna know what it is, I will figure it out for you even if I don't know myself. Uh, I can give you advice on rattlesnake relocation. Again, my website and the press and links has a bunch of articles on how to make your yard snake unfriendly, how to protect your dog from snake bite with rattlesnake aversion training, whether I recommend the rattlesnake vaccine or not for dogs, I don't, why, all those things, and rattlesnake proof fencing or anything else snake related. And I'd like to finish by saying for any of you who actually want to help snakes with money, which snake helpers, snake uh, rehabilitators and snake PR people like myself absolutely need because we do things like relocations for free and gas prices are expensive when you're driving three hours from Vallejo or three hours from Central Coast like I am, those types of things. So you can support my organization at that website, um, CCSS Fund, after Bitly if you'd like. And then my two favorite um, snake nonprofits are Advocates for Snake Preservation. I'm a board member on that nonprofit and we are working on a lot of coexistence um, uh, strategies for rattlesnakes. They really were my mentors in terms of learning about the social behaviors of rattlesnakes using camera technology. They were doing it long before we decided to do it and bring it to the public. And then Save the Snakes, which is a newer organization that's actually in fact based out of Northern California, but has a, a really broad, broad reach. They're doing a lot of really interesting education and outreach with snakes all around the world. And so I can highly recommend either of those as a great place to throw a couple greenbacks to because they will very much appreciate and benefit from your support. So thank you so much. I am now done talking for a little while and really looking forward to answering some questions that Allison has been writing down. Um, looks like I've saved about 15 minutes, which is pretty good. I didn't talk too much. That's what I was going for. So, all right, Allison, what kind of questions can I answer? Uh, well, a round of applause from me, since you can't hear everyone's virtual applause. There are a lot of glowing compliments in the chat, and thank you so much. I know I learned a lot, and you are correct. There are so many good questions in the chat. I don't think we will have time to get to all of them, so I am going to start with some easier ones that are sh probably shorter answers. And then we will get to some of the questions that came up over and over again. And if we don't get to your question, I am so sorry. I hope that you will email uh, Dr. Taylor or use some of these great resources that we share in the follow-up email, which will be coming to you on Friday. So you can check that out later on. Okay, on to these questions. Um, I've always heard that rattlesnakes are mostly blind and rely on vibration and heat. True or false? False, um, with a grain of truth. So rattlesnakes have good vision, but in the complete darkness, they would be blind just like we would be. And they actually have thermoreception in the pits. So they're called pit vipers, the pits that are right underneath their eyes, their nostrils. Those can actually sense temperature differences even in complete darkness. And they, if it's something like a warm blooded prey, like a rodent runs by, that thermal image can be used by a rattlesnake that doesn't, can't see at all in the darkness to be able to um, bite its prey. Um, so they actually have really good um, smell and taste. They use the tongue flicking to be able to kind of smell the air, um, but their vision is actually pretty good. So it's both false and true, I would say. Good vision, but also the ability to sense heat. And what was the other sense that they mentioned? vibration. Yeah. So rattlesnakes, um, just like all snakes don't have, um, outer ears. They don't have exposed ears to hear sound waves. So they're primarily their the ears that are inside their bodies deep inside are primarily going to be stimulated by vibrations from the ground. And they definitely will hear you approaching from far away by the stomping of your boots. And that will put them on guard. And that's one of the main things that they're going to use to sense that you're there. Mm, that leads right into one of the other questions was, can you warn snakes on the trail by pounding hiking poles or walking with heavy strides? Sounds like yes, to some extent. You could, but if you're on a, on a um, nice open trail, then it's probably not necessary. So you could do that, but you, and 
Answers like this are always going to be unsatisfying to people, but the truth is that rattlesnakes are tricky. Each animal has different personality. Each animal behaves differently. For the most part, a rattlesnake that is coiled up, like say it's on the edge of a trail, you're going to walk right by it. You're never going to see it. It's never going to strike you. It doesn't have a reason to do that. If you're banging around, you might, it might be like, what's happening? It might be nervous. It might be more likely to strike when you do walk by because it might be more nervous. In another circumstance, it might be good. If you're walking through tall grass, it might be good to be kind of banging around and you may be able to elicit that rattlesnake to rattle a warning and then you would back off. However, it's not true that rattlesnakes always rattle before striking. Unfortunately, it's definitely not true. That's a myth. Rattlesnakes sometimes rattle, sometimes they don't. Individual rattlesnakes I've studied over the years, some individuals are mellow and they never rattle no matter what. We catch them mm -hmm. as scientists, we're collecting data, we're getting blood samples. They're like, mm. and then some rattlesnakes are 10 feet away. And so there's no hard and fast rule. I would say that if you're on a, um, watching where you're stepping on an open trail, you should be in pretty good shape. That sounds good. I, one of the other questions in the chat that's related to this was that someone has noticed that rattlesnakes in their area have stopped rattling as much so is that just the behavior of that snake, those snakes in that area? There isn't a rhyme or reason for that. I think this person was located in Sonoma County. You know, that's another one that I, I would love to put in to the, um, I don't put it in as a myth because we don't know if it's a myth or not. It's an idea that a lot of people have heard. Some people have observed it themselves. Some people have heard it from other people. So it's one of those um, tales that's out there that we don't know if it's true or not. Here's the story that I'm gonna try to make a long story short. The idea goes like this. Rattlesnakes that are more likely to rattle, if that's heritable, right? If like they could pass that on to their offspring. If those animals that rattle and give themselves away are more likely to get killed by a human, they would just not pass on that gene. And eventually the ones that rattle less are the ones that would spread throughout the environment. And then therefore we're getting kind of this natural selection for rattling less. Mm -hmm. And that was something that people started to say was occurring. And if there was a, an NPR someone was on NPR and it was not an expert, it was someone else, it was a non-Rousnik expert who unfortunately portrayed that hypothesis as a fact on NPR and it spread like wildfire. The truth is we have no scientific data for that. So I think it's a fascinating hypothesis. I don't personally think it's true. It could happen in certain areas. It could happen. It could also be though, not natural selection. It could be that the rattlesnakes are just, uh, maybe there's been more construction. Maybe there's been a change in the habitat and they're just more used to people. We just don't know the answer to that, but I, mm -hmm. I'm very suspicious of the idea that we're like having natural selection select from for rattlesnakes not to, um, not to rattle as much. So a really, really common observation or a common thing people have heard, no data for it, but an interesting idea. I've thought a lot about how you would test it scientifically and it's just such a hard study to yeah. do if anyone could really do it. Yeah, so a great, great question. Okay, another question that came up multiple times in the chat was about relocation. Um, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but can you expand on the effect of relocation on rattlesnakes? Some folks have heard that it isn't good for the snakes to relocate them. Um, is it bad to relocate them while mating? Um, can you just talk a little bit more about some of those details? Absolutely. So rattlesnake relocation is actually very nuanced and very tricky, which is why having a professional come and do it for you is a good idea. But what constitutes a professional? I've heard of some professionals that take all the snakes to one area miles away and dump them off. That's not a good thing to do. Um, I'm a scientist. I've actually done a number of studies on relocation where I'm looking to find the way that's best for rattlesnakes. And there's so much variation that's really hard, but the consensus among scientists based on actual data is that if you go about a quarter mile or a half mile away, the snake is unlikely to come back, but the snake is likely to have a good outcome. If you take them further away, they're gonna wander around, they're more likely to get hit by a car or picked off by a predator. And then there's nuances too, right? Like, okay, so what if it's a mother with her babies? Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, super sensitive time period. You gotta make sure you get all of them together, keep them together before you relocate them. A very, very, very pregnant female, I might actually keep her in captivity and wait until she gives birth, wait until she has that 10 days with her offspring before letting her go. These are calls that I make as a scientist. And that's why it's really important to have a professional do that. The one thing I will tell you that was really fascinating was we did a study with short distance relocation. And we found that the only time they came back is if we took a male away from a female, he was trying to get to mate with him. He beelined back the next day. And so it seems like it's not a good idea to, well, why would you ever do that though? You probably would relocate, relocate both of them to the same mm -hmm. spot, right? So if you do find snakes together, relocating to the same spot is a good idea. 
I will also say that one of the most important things that you can do if you relocate snakes is to not just putting them nearby somewhere, putting them somewhere that's good habitat. It's not just dumping them out in a field somewhere, putting them into a place where there's big rock crevices, there's big thick brush or at least ground squirrel burrows they can go down into so that they're not completely disoriented and exposed. Um, that's just kind of a, a short, like a crash course. Like I actually teach big rattlesnake safety and rattlesnake relocation classes where we talk about this for hours because people sometimes want to learn how to do this on their own. Um, the the uh, owner of rattlesnake relations that I recommended to you earlier had a Zoom call with me and we talked all about this because he wanted to make sure that he was doing right by the snakes that he was doing. So that's why I would recommend him for you all. Um, it's complicated, but we do our best. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay, there's just more questions coming in. Another one. Um, what is the average litter size of a rattlesnake? The litter size of rattlesnakes varies pretty dramatically. So northern and southern Pacific rattlesnakes are going to be commonly from about three to seven, although sometimes it's more, sometimes it's even just one. So usually you're in your less than 10. Occasionally it can go as many as 10 to 15, very rarely. Whereas something like a western diamondback rattlesnake over in Texas may have many, many, many more. They can have 30 or 40 sometimes, although again, usually it's fewer than that. Okay. Wow. That is a big range. Yeah. Um, more on baby rattlesnakes. Are babies born with rattles and what are rattles made out of? Babies are born with what we call the, the natal button. So it's basically their first piece of their rattle segment, but because, and it's made of keratin, by the way, just like our fingernails and the baby's button can't make a sound though. And the mm. reason for that is that rattlesnake rattles are not actually like a baby rattle where you would shake it kind of like the baby rattle I showed right down here facetiously. It's not filled with something. Instead, it's these each segment of the rattle, which they get a new one every time they shed their skin, which may or may not be once a year. So you cannot use it to age them. That's another myth. Um, each one is kind of loose against the one behind it so that when they shake their tail with their incredibly fast tail shaker muscle, they hit each other, these little pieces of keratin bang against each other and make a rattling noise. So baby rattlesnakes will shake their little tails like crazy, but there's no noise until they've had their first shed, their second shed actually. So they, they're born, mm -hmm. they shed, and then their second shed will out, allow them to have this really high pitched like at first. And as they get bigger and older, their rattles, the new rattles they make will be bigger and bigger. And then they can make that larger noise later on. Great, okay. Gosh, that's, there are just still more questions coming in. That is helpful. Just wanted to clarify, you said they can live up to 60 years, not 16, 60. 60, six that, zero, yeah. That is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and then we also have another question here that um, might be on people's minds, especially right now. Has the population of rattlesnakes dropped because of the fires in California? Is there any research being done on that? I don't, I don't think there's any research being done specifically in, in California that I know of. There is research that's about to begin. So there's a professor out of Cal State San Bernardino. Her name is Dr. Brianna Putman, and you can follow her on Twitter as well. That's again, Dr. Brianna Putman. And she recently was awarded a grant to study the effect of wildfires on rattlesnakes, but she, she's just getting started with that. So I will tell you that um, most, just like you might imagine, the very severe fires, like the ones that, that have been racking our state recently, um, are killing most of the trees. They're, because they're such thick underbrush, they're raging very, very, um, really, really hot fires. They're killing a lot of the wildlife. So rattlesnakes usually in a, in a regular fire may be able to go underground and survive that fire a lot, along with a lot of other small animals. Um, most of them are probably not making it in these big fires. So I would say that absolutely rattlesnakes are dying in these fires, just like all other wildlife are. But the fires are, um, are also probably driving some of the rattlesnakes on the edges outward and maybe in towards places where there's people. So mm -hmm. people in the fire areas, and just like construction does, right? There's a lot of construction, fires, other things like that are some of these rattlesnakes that can move are moving. And that's why we're seeing more of them in our yards as well. Yes, that makes sense. Um, thank you. I have, there are two, there's just so many questions. We will do our best <laughs> and know that um, we will include resources to other rattlesnake conservation folks doing this work. I wanted to end with um, this great question um, and get this on the recording for folks since education is one of your main goals. 
Someone said, I talk to folks in rural areas all the time about the importance of snakes and rattlesnakes. And I always hit that brick wall of it endangered my kid, my pet, my neighbor, et cetera. And it is so tough to have those conversations. How do you keep it positive and how do you have advice for moving around that barrier with people talking to them about the importance of snakes? That is a wonderful, wonderful question. I can't believe you only gave me one minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> so let me, let me start by saying that on my blog, I actually have a blog post. It's called like PR strategies, public relations strategies for rattlesnakes, where I talk about how to do this. I will also mention that as a scientist, I want to know if my intuition is correct. So we're actually studying this right now. We're studying what the best strategy is. What I have found in kind of a really quick answer is I have found that being indignant or know it all does not work at all. It makes them stop listening. Instead, just really leveling with them and telling them some of the things that I talked about earlier about how, you know, killing a rattlesnake isn't really helping. But my hunch is that when you talk to them about the mother of rattlesnakes with the babies, and the, um, you may have wondered why I was saying all this stuff. Did it, did it move you? Does it move you when I talk about how they take care of their babies and how they have little umbilical cords? They might live 60 years. All those things are done on purpose it's because I'm an outreach professional. And I believe that that helps to cause people to think less poorly of rattlesnakes. So we are testing that scientifically right as we speak with a survey that's live all over the world. Hopefully we'll have data on that. It seems to me like that may be more successful than, oh, they eat rodents. That doesn't seem to work. But I would refer you back to the PR segment, which I'll make sure Allison has that link for her to send to you all. So what a great question. Thank you for asking it. And I'm still learning, by the way, every day, I'm still learning and trying out my strategies for how to talk to people. Yes, definitely. Yes. Thank you for that great question. And you all can look forward to a lengthy follow-up email because it is lengthy. It will, and I have to upload this great recording and include it as well. It will be coming to you on Friday. So take a look, it'll be coming just like you got the link to this presentation through Eventbrite. We will try to answer as many of your questions as possible, include lots of resources that you can share and you can share the recording as well. It will be on our YouTube channel. Um, and again, a big round of applause for Dr. Taylor and your amazing work, it's such important work. And I will also be sure to include a link again for donating to support Central Coast Snake Services as well, if you would like to support her directly. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your great questions and your engagement with this program. And most of all, your interest and passion for rattlesnakes. Thank you all. Thank you. I Thank hope you to everyone see you another time. Thank you. Bye.